Well, thank you very much for those very kind introductions. It's really great to be back. I really appreciate uh, Peter Katzenstein and John Mearsheimer uh, uh, serving as the commentators uh, today. Uh, when Cornell first uh, approached me to celebrate the sesquicentennial by uh, talking about the 25th anniversary of the end of history, uh, I was a little uncertain as to how to respond because for the last 25 years I've been trying to get beyond that essay and move on to another topic uh, since everybody, anytime anything happens in the world, says, well, what about the end of history, you know? Uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's actually important, I think, to review that argument uh, on the 25th anniversary because, uh, frankly, the year 2014 has not been a great year uh, in uh, world politics. Uh, you have <clears throat> Russia and China, two um, uh, authoritarian powers that are on the move uh, and um, with you know, ambitions and claims. Uh, you have ISIS and this continuing uh, remarkable level of uh, instability in the Arab world, uh, and then continuing conflicts in Afghanistan, Yemen, Pakistan, uh, and so forth. And so I think it is uh, worth reviewing where we are. Uh, in a certain sense, the two-volume book that I've just written uh, the Origins of Political Order and Political Order and Political Decay. If you really want to get the full version, you should read all thousand pages uh, there because that's really my you know, a more considered effort to rewrite the, the end of history. But I can give you a, a, a short version of it uh, uh, in the uh, lecture tonight. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is talk about four topics. I'm going to go over the argument of the end of history and what I think is still uh, valid from that. I'm going to talk then, uh, secondly, about uh, what alternative models uh, are out there. Uh, third, I'm going to talk about the question of what's wrong with democracy in the world in general and what are the big uh, challenges it faces. And then I'm going to finish up with a uh, discussion about political decay. Uh, that is to say, will countries that are now consolidated democracies uh, always uh, remain that way? And, and, the, and the third and fourth of those topics are really ones that uh, I'm introducing from uh, especially the, uh, the most recent of the books that I've published. So let's, uh, let's begin. What was the end of history or that basic argument about? I wrote actually the original essay in the winter of 1988-89, well before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the argument I think was a fairly simple one. Uh, for the previous 150 years, most progressive intellectuals believed that there was this thing called history. That is to say, a progressive uh, uh, evolution of human societies. Uh, and the Marxist uh, ones believed that there was an end of history which would be some form of a communist utopia. And my simple observation uh, back in the winter of 88, 89 was it didn't look like we were going to get there. Uh, and in fact, given the trends going on in the Soviet Union and China and other places, it looked like history would uh, uh, terminate or evolve uh, not into communism, but uh, the penultimate stage, which would be some version of liberal democracy and a market uh, economy. And I continue uh, to believe that that argument is fundamentally right. Uh, I actually believe that there is such a thing as history in this Marxist Hegelian uh, sense. We don't use that word anymore. We use terms like modernization uh, or development, as in the US Agency for International Development. But it basically means the same thing. It means that human societies have gone through a um, coherent process of transition from one type of political and social and economic organization uh, to another. And the question is, where is that process uh, headed? Uh, and I think uh, it, despite the instability of this particular year, it's a good idea to step back and think about how the world has changed. Uh, actually, a, a convenient starting point is the year 1970. So I showed up at Cornell in the fall of 1970, right after the Cornell crisis as a freshman. <clears throat> in that year, there were approximately 35 uh, electoral democracies uh, in the world. Uh, out of, you know, at that point, probably 120, 130 uh, countries in the world. Uh, so democracies were uh, no more than about a quarter of all the countries uh, in the world. In the year 2014, uh, depending on how you would categorize uh, certain countries like, let's say, Turkey, uh, uh, there are about 115 to 120 electoral democracies. My colleague at Stanford, Larry Diamond, runs a much more precise tab based on 
uh, Freedom House scores and, and other uh, metrics of who counts as a democracy. But basically, we've gone from a world in which a quarter of the countries were, were, had elections and some kinds of democratic procedures to one in which about two-thirds of the world uh, 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 operates under that kind of a system. Uh, now, we've had, uh, as Diamond points out, a democratic recession for the last eight years. So for the last eight years in a row, aggregate Freedom House scores around the world have been dropping. And there's obviously very troubling things like Russia's behavior vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and uh, the fact that China seems to be on a roll doing very well as an authoritarian power. And I guess one of the questions for the future is, should we regard this as a kind of uh, correction, like a stock market correction, where the overall pattern will be a continuing of what Samuel Huntington labeled the third wave uh, of democratization, in which the general pattern will be towards uh, more democracies around the world, or is something more fundamental happening where we're going to see a really big reversal uh, of that third wave and a regression uh, to some other form uh, of government? Now, the one um, social phenomenon that I would point out that underlies this political uh, transformation, I think, is a very important one. Since 1970, global economic output has roughly quadrupled. Uh, it has quadrupled because uh, we have created a globalized world, a reasonably uh, open uh, capitalist economic order that has been hugely productive, and we've seen massive, massive declines uh, in, global, uh, in global poverty in places like uh, India and China, and we've seen the rise of middle classes in many parts of the world. Now, there is a long-standing tradition that goes back to people like Sam Huntington and Barrington Moore that argues that there is a close connection between the rise of middle classes and democracy. It's not inevitable. There are many middle classes that turn against uh, democracy, but by and large, once you reach a certain level of education, uh, own assets that the government can take away from you, there tends to be a, a greater inclination to want to participate uh, to some degree in political rule, which is the starting point. It's not the completion, but it is the starting point for democracy. And part of the reason that I think this third wave of democratizations uh, has occurred uh, in places like Brazil or Turkey or Indonesia uh, is uh, because of that underlying wave of prosperity and the kinds of social changes that it has uh, brought uh, in its wake. Uh, and um, there's no guarantee that that kind of economic growth will continue. We could go back into a protectionist phase as we did in the 1930s, and a lot of those gains could be lost. But I do think that there is a certain social and economic mechanism out there uh, that is pointing us uh, in this direction. Now, that's the, but I'm not going to make any predictions about this. I'm not going to stand up here and say in 20 years, you know, the world economy will have doubled again and you'll have more middle classes and more democracies. I think we're just going to have to wait and see. Let's move on to the second topic, which is the question of alternative models, because the argument in the end of history uh, was really that for a society that, that aspired to be modern, uh, there was really only one broadly speaking form of uh, political and economic organization, some form of liberal democracy and some form uh, of market economy. And clearly, if you look around the world today, not everybody uh, does that. Uh, and there are alternative models. And the, the question I think that that begs is, uh, if you accept this kind of Marxist framework where you, know, you do have a progressive evolution across different societies towards different forms of social organization, uh, is that direction pointing towards an alternative model uh, that would in some sense be uh, higher, more just, more sustainable, more productive uh, along a lot of different dimensions than what we have now in the uh, developed uh, democratic world? Uh, and I think you know, we can go over several of them. Uh, I actually think that there's only one that has a remote chance of being considered a serious alternative, and that's the, uh, uh, the China model. But let's run through a couple of the ones that are out there right now. Start with uh, Islam. We have Islamic republics in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, in other well, Islamic monarchies. We have Islamic government uh, in a number of places. Is this the future of mankind? 
Uh, I sort of doubt it uh, because it seems to me that anyone that is not already culturally Muslim has very little interest in uh, moving in that direction. But I think the Arab Spring actually points to an interesting phenomenon, which is that uh, you know, prior to that uprising, it was very common to say that there was a, uh, either a Muslim or an Arab exception to the third wave, that there was something about uh, the cultural background of those societies that would not allow democracy uh, to emerge, that they were too passive, they were accepting of authority, and so forth. And I think uh, if there's one thing that the Arab Spring proved, that that's not correct. Uh, and in fact, I think you can see a lot of the same mechanisms operating in places like Tunisia and Egypt that operated in Ukraine or in Turkey or in Brazil or other places where you have a rising middle class. Those revolutions were driven by exactly that same class of relatively young, relatively educated, urbanized uh, middle class people as uh, similar revolutions have been driven in other parts of the world. The failure of the Arab Spring I think was not a failure in that inchoate uh, desire not to live under a tyrannical government. Uh, the failure was one of institutionalization. It was a failure in the ability of people that wanted a democratic society to understand how to institutionalize democracy uh, in a way that would be sustainable. I think this is a problem that you know, more Western-oriented liberal groups in Russia, Ukraine, uh, the Middle East, all of them have had that. They don't know how to organize. Uh, to this day, I am absolutely not convinced that the more liberal forces in Egypt, for example, were less numerous than the people that supported the Muslim Brotherhood. What the Muslim Brotherhood had was organization. They knew how to get out the vote. They could go into every rural precinct and get their followers out to the polls, and that's why they won uh, the early uh, elections uh, after the military government uh, stepped aside. And I don't think the story about the um, democracy in that part of the world is written yet. If you had asked in Europe in the fall of 1851, what are the prospects for democracy in Europe, I don't think you would have gotten a very uh, positive answer three years after uh, the springtime of peoples, the uprisings you know, that occurred in virtually every single continental European country uh, in 1848, because that process of institutionalization is long and it is hard and it takes a very uh, long period of time. Uh, and so I don't think the final uh, story has been written. I do not think that as an alternative, something like the Islamic Republic is terribly viable. If you look at Iran right now, half the population doesn't like the regime. You know, they would like a different kind uh, of regime and it's precisely that better educated, more modern, more urbanized half uh, that would support uh, a very different kind of politics. And so I don't think this is a, a particularly good alternative. Russia, I think we can dispense with very quickly because the economic model uh, is not a, you know, who's bought a, apart from, a, let's say, an AK-47, who's ever bought a manufactured product made in Russia? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a heavily oil-dependent economy. And I also think that the course that President Putin has set this year after the annexation of Crimea makes it a very uh, difficult model to sustain uh, because I think it's going to be inevitably based on external uh, expansion, you know, the reunification of Russians uh, outside of Russia. And we've had experience with that kind of regime before in the 20th century, uh, that you do it to gain uh, domestic support, but internationally it gets you embroiled with all of your neighbors, and for that reason uh, I think it's not a terribly sustainable model. The most serious alternative uh, is really China. Uh, China is heir to a very long-standing civilization. Uh, I argued in the first volume in, in, in uh, The Origins of Political Order that China not only developed a state early on, it developed a modern state, modern in Max Weber's sense of bureaucratic, rational, impersonal. Uh, and they did this really in the third century BC. And in fact, uh, the present Chinese government is an heir to that extremely long uh, uh, Confucian uh, tradition, and part of the reason that they've been able to modernize as rapidly uh, as they have after 1978 uh, is that they can call on that wellspring of a very, very deep tradition of uh, a bureaucratic state, and they do it better than any other uh, society uh, in the world. Uh, if you look at what makes for a high-quality Chinese authoritarianism, I think I would point to 
uh, several things. So, for example, they are rule-bound to an increasing extent. Uh, one of the big weaknesses of authoritarian regimes in other parts of the world, like the Middle East uh, or in Africa, is that authoritarian rulers don't know when to step down. If Gaddafi or Mubarak uh, had left power after 10 years, I think they would actually be probably pretty positively uh, remembered by their peoples, but instead they stayed uh, in, in you know, one case over 40 years and another case for about uh, 35, way past the point where they were uh, actually contributing to the health of their societies. Uh, in China, one of the interesting things about governance there is since 1978, you've had this steady uh, spread of rules, not the rule of law. The rule of law is really a firm constitutional limitation uh, in, in the power of the most powerful in the society, but there is a spread of laws, uh, rules, including uh, rules for leadership turnover. And so we've now had three of these 10-year cycles of term limits, and you have mandatory retirements and uh, things of that uh, sort. Another thing they do well is actually state autonomy. Uh, there is actually an advantage to being an authoritarian government when you're trying to do uh, important kinds of reforms. If you think about the reforms that Deng Xiaoping accomplished after 1978 in decollectivizing agriculture, creating a market economy, shifting that entire society into a very different form of economic production, you couldn't possibly have done this in a democracy. Not with all of the interest groups and legal restrictions and uh, constraints on power that exist uh, in uh, a modern liberal democracy, but you can do it in a, in a dictatorship because the state is not constrained by either uh, a firm rule of law or by, uh, uh, or by uh, democratic, normal democratic politics. And it means that if you want to do, undertake positive reforms, you can do it much faster and more effectively. So they put up a high-speed rail system costing you know, something like $400 billion, and they do it in five years. And you know, I live in California, and we're still putzing around, you know, trying to put up a high-speed rail system between Los Angeles and San Francisco, and I'm not counting on it to <laughs> emerge any time in my lifetime, uh, I guarantee you. Uh, and so there are, and, and, and finally, I would say the other thing about the Chinese system that is really important to understand is a moral characteristic. Uh, I think one of the deepest legacies of Confucianism is a belief on the part of ruling elites that they have an obligation to something that is higher than just their, themselves and their families, enriching themselves and their, their families. Uh, if you look around the world at where uh, developmental states have all been located, the vast majority of them are in East Asia, in parts of the world that are under this broad Chinese Confucian uh, cultural uh, domain, because in Confucianism you have a long tradition of training princes to rule justly in the interests of the broader community. And that's why in East Asia it's been possible, and Peter, among others, has, has written about this. I mean, this is one of the reasons that they can do things like run an industrial policy, which in Latin America or in Africa or in South Asia gets incredibly corrupted, but in East Asia uh, has actually been turned towards um, uh, high-speed uh, development. Uh, and I think that, you know, Communist Party is very corrupt in many, many ways, but there has still been a developmental focus that they have managed to uh, maintain that is extremely difficult for other authoritarian uh, countries to, uh, to achieve. So that's the good part. What's the bad part? And I think, in fact, the bad parts of the Chinese system are all the counterparts of the things that I just mentioned as being advantages. Uh, beginning with uh, the moral one, which is that although they are the heirs of this Confucian tradition, they're really confused about this because the other half of it is Marxist-Leninist and they can't either genuinely uh, revive that, uh, you know, that, that indigenous Chinese tradition uh, or make a break from Marxism-Leninism and what fills a gap morally for many Chinese is just plain naked self-interest and it's, I think, hard to run a, a country for a long period uh, on that basis. Uh, the economic model, I mean, this is a more technical issue, but I think uh, has got some, um, uh, some real problems. Uh, <clears throat> the most uh, unsolvable political problem they've got is what in Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese historiography is called the problem of the bad emperor. So if you have a good emperor, like Deng Xiaoping, 
uh, because you don't have constraints, you don't have formal uh, checks and balances in the system, you can do a lot of good very, very rapidly. But the same absence of checks and balances means that if you get a bad emperor, you're in big trouble. Uh, and most Chinese, I think, would say that they had a pretty bad emperor recently in the form of Mao Zedong, who could you know, do and undertake policies leading to the deaths of tens of millions of people because there were no checks on his power in the system. And right now, what you're seeing unfold in China is uh, perhaps another version of that. So Xi Jinping, the new um, uh, Chinese uh, 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 leader, uh, has been accumulating power on an unprecedented scale <clears throat> in a way that is bursting apart the kind of uh, understanding of collective leadership that emerged since 1978. He bids fair to be the most powerful Chinese ruler since Deng and possibly even since Mao. And this is where I think you have the real vulnerability of that system. We do not know at this point whether he is a good or a bad emperor. We just don't know. You can construct a positive uh, scenario where he's going to liberalize the economy, he's going to break the power of the state-owned enterprises, he's eventually going to open up the Chinese system, or he could just be one of the worst dictators uh, uh, in uh, recent Chinese memory and undo a lot of the rule-bound decision-making that uh, China, you know, that has set China apart as an authoritarian country. We don't know, and if it's the wrong form of emperor, the Chinese are in big trouble, as well as probably a lot of its neighbors uh, as well. And so I think for all of these reasons, this is not a system uh, that is exportable, and I don't think that it is a model unless you are Korea or Japan or some other country within that cultural sphere, I think it's very hard to replicate that model. Uh, and therefore, I don't think it's, it's, you know, it's going to persist as a real alternative. In other words, in 50 years, I could imagine China adopting more rule of law and opening up their political system, making it more liberal and more democratic. I find it very hard to believe that you'll have anything like the Chinese system being replicated uh, in, other, uh, in other parts of the world. All right, so that's the alternative. The third topic is there's a fourth, you know, so besides Islam, Russia, China, there's a, there's a fourth alternative out there, which is basically none of the above. That is to say, the problem in the world is not that there's a superior model of an alternative form of political and economic organization that's waiting to be taken up, the problem is that countries that want to be democratic, that want to you know, create a democratic system, will just never get there. And that, I think, is a much more pressing uh, issue, and that's really the core of my most recent book. So the basic structure of my argument is, is as follows. In my view, there are three uh, pillars on which a modern liberal democracy res, uh, uh, rests. And you really have to have all three pillars in a certain kind of balance to have an effective uh, political system. So the first pillar is the state. It's the legitimate monopoly of force over territory. A state is all about, uh, it's all about power. It's about generating and being able to use power to enforce laws, protect the community, keep the peace, uh, build infrastructure, deliver services, so on and so forth. All right? The second institution is the rule of law not rule by law, which the Chinese do, but rule of law in which the most powerful actors in the society are constrained by mutually agreed upon uh, rules. Uh, if the president and prime minister, king, can make up the rules as they go along, that's not the rule of law. The rule of law is fundamentally a constraint. And then finally, the third pillar is democratic accountability, which we in the West understand to be a series of uh, procedures, free and fair multi-party elections, that are designed to produce substantive accountability, meaning the government has to respond to the wishes of the whole community and not just to the narrow interests of whoever happens to be running the government. And in that structure, there's an inherent tension because the state builds up power and uses power, whereas the rule of law and democracy constrain power, right? And if you are too far at either end of that spectrum, you don't have a happy uh, political order. So, Obviously, if you've got all constraint uh, but no state, then you've got Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, uh, you know, one of these stateless societies in which anyone with an AK-47 can put together a militia and take whatever property they want. That's not, you know, that's not a good uh, situation. On the other hand, if you've only got the state 
uh, without those instruments of constraint. Basically, you have China. So you have the possibility for good, but you also have the possibility uh, of a really great uh, dictatorship uh, in which rulers use discretion to essentially do whatever they want. And so I think a proper uh, uh, political system really has to have a balance of all three of those uh, institutions. But there's a much more important distinction that I think we have tended, we political scientists and we policymakers, have tended to pay much uh, less attention to than the democratic pillar, and that is the transition from what you'd call a patrimonial or neo-patrimonial state to a modern state. A modern state is an impersonal state. In a modern state, your relationship to the government does not depend on whether you're a friend or a relative of the ruler. It depends on simply your status as a citizen, and there is a clear distinction between public and private. The state is supposed to serve public interest and not the narrow private interest of the people that run the state, the elites running the state. A patrimonial uh, government, by contrast, is one in which the state is regarded as the patrimony of, uh, of the, uh, the ruler. So in, you know, in days when you had kings and queens, you could literally give away a province uh, to a daughter as a wedding present and all the people that lived on it because essentially the king owned, uh, uh, owned it. Uh, so today we don't have anybody that gets up and says, I own this country. Uh, in the way that people used to. Uh, they have the pretense of having modern states with bureaucracies and prime ministers and legislatures and so forth, but the reality in very many political orders, including many democracies, is what political scientists call neo-patrimonialism, meaning that the underlying reality of the state is actually uh, a essentially kleptocratic, rent-seeking uh, cabal of insiders that want to use their access to political power to enrich themselves uh, personally, which generates bad government, corruption, inequality, and a lot of ills in, uh, uh, in very predictable ways. And I would argue that the single biggest problem, and, and so I guess in reflecting over the 25 years since the end of history, this is the aspect of political development I didn't take nearly seriously enough. It is much easier to move from an autocracy to a democracy than it is to move from a patrimonial or a neo-patrimonial state to a modern state. And if you don't believe it, just look at Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, after the American invasions, we staged elections. Uh, in Afghanistan, maybe they're better referred to as election-like events, but there were still, you know, uh, there were still, uh, uh, you know, procedures that produced some uh, degree of democratic legitimacy. What we completely failed to do in both of those cases was to create a modern state, a state that was not corrupt, that could defend its own territory, that had sufficient legitimacy as a modern impersonal state to win the loyalty uh, of uh, the citizens. And we did not understand how to, uh, how to bring this about. Um, and that, I would say, is the Achilles heel of many contemporary democracies. I don't want to spend a lot of time giving you examples, but uh, uh, corruption and lack of state capacity and the failure to deliver basic public services has been, you know, that's the reason that the uh, Orange Revolution in uh, Ukraine uh, initially failed. Uh, it's why people are extremely unhappy in Brazil, uh, where you've got a government that is mired in corruption, that does not deliver, you know, basic things like education and, and bus service. Uh, in India, uh, you've got a very patronage-based political system, high levels of corruption. One of the reasons I think the Indians voted for Mr. Modi earlier this year was they are hoping for a strong leader. They want somebody that's going to be able to modernize the uh, uh, Indian state and realize actually the promise of democracy. And that is a, uh, is a much tougher problem that, uh, where the route to modernization is uh, less clear. The final issue, I'm, I'm running out of time, so let me just conclude very briefly. Uh, the final issue is political decay. So if you're interested in this topic, the, the question is, once you become a consolidated, modern, uh, industrialized democracy, is it ever possible to fall back? My conclusion uh, from having written these two volumes is any regime can fall backwards and can decay. Uh, and the decay takes one of two forms. It either has to do with intellectual rigidity, where you create institutions for one set of conditions, the conditions change, and you're not willing to adapt, 
And the other one has to do with insider capture in which the elites use their position as elites to gain uh, political power to reinforce their, uh, their uh, positions. And I think for a whole variety of reasons, I, uh, that part of my, my last book was excerpted in, in uh, Foreign Affairs a, a couple of issues ago. So if you want to read that, you can. But I think that we're already seeing a lot of uh, signs of that in the United States where uh, you have a kind of repatrimonialization of uh, the American government through the rise of extremely well-funded and uh, well-organized interest groups, a tremendous amount of uh, institutional inertia that makes it extremely difficult uh, to reform uh, the system and this collision of polarization with uh, a check and balance uh, constitutional system that uh, makes it almost impossible for you know the American government to make uh, basic decisions. So those I think are the the challenges uh, uh, and as you can tell you know a lot of these ideas were not present in my original uh, uh, take on all this stuff. There's a lot of questions we could cover, uh, many unresolved questions like the question of inequality, middle class stagnation, uh, the impact of globalization on technology, on our social structure, which I think is probably one of the biggest challenges facing not just American democracy, but democracy uh, across the board. You know, global public goods, there's a lot of issues uh, internationally that cannot be met on an uh, on a national level, and we don't have the governance institutions to really uh, provide them, but I'm afraid that's going to have to be the subject of a uh, further lecture. So thank you very much for your attention.